We introduced scheduling last class, so the main topic today will be to look at smarter ways to do scheduling and some of the interesting issues that you get into in, in scheduling computing systems. We'll look at how priorities work and how that affects scheduling. Let me recap what we started to talk about last class about scheduling. So we had looking at this scheduling problem is always about sharing some limited resource. With the traffic light, the real limited resource is this intersection that we can only have one direction of traffic using at a time. Or with a computer, the limited resource is the core that can only execute one stream of instructions at the time. This is very like the intersection of the traffic. We can only have one stream of instructions going through there at a time. There are two big goals for scheduling. There's some other goals often. But the two big competing goals are we want to maximize use of our expensive resource. We would like to keep the core busy doing useful things all the time. But we also want to have some fairness. And the way to maximize resource use means less switching. We would maximize the use of our intersections if the traffic lights stayed green as long as there was traffic going. That would upset the people waiting two hours to get across an intersection. But that would maximize the use. There's a big cost to switching, and we don't want to incur that cost any more than we have to. But if we care about fairness, if we care about other things like meeting deadlines, then we have to do some switching, and we're going to have more switching to try to get fairness. That's the big trade-off. And it's important to remember that switching is very expensive. Any change to our scheduler that ends up leading to more switching may improve some other property we care about, like fairness. But it's definitely wasting resources to do that. We can think of scheduling in two different contexts. One is where you know all the tasks that you need to execute at the beginning. So you could plan a schedule in advance. If the supervisor knows all the processes that have to run, how long they're going to take, and when they need to finish by, you could, in advance, figure out a schedule that's going to give you the, the best properties in terms of using your resources and meeting all those deadlines. If you don't know in advance, and most of the scheduling we've been talking about and, and will be talking about, the scheduler is making decisions on the fly. Every time you get a primary interrupt, the scheduler has a choice to decide which process runs next. And it can make that choice based on everything it knows at that particular time. It doesn't try to make predictions about the future too much. Schedules are actually getting better at making some predictions about the future, even on-demand ones. This is one of the things Mavericks does to try to save power. But for the most part, the supervisor has to make decisions based on what it can do now. It's not planning ahead. It's making one decision at a time. Where do you think plan scheduling should be used? Are there any computing systems that can use plan scheduling? Yes. OK, good. Suggestion is real-time systems. What does it mean to say a system is real-time? Good. Yeah, so if we have some kind of real important deadline that has to be met, does that mean we can use plan scheduling? Is that enough? So let's first talk about systems that might have that. So if we're talking about a system that has real-time deadlines, so people talk about two kinds of real-time systems. Sometimes there, there's actually three. So a hard real-time system is one where if you miss a deadline, that's as bad as crashing or producing a wrong result. That's a complete system failure. That's like Apple having the go-to fail in there is the same consequence as missing some timing deadline. What's an example of a system that would be categorized as a hard real-time system? None of you use anything that has any hard deadlines? Yeah. A pacemaker? OK. Good. A pacemaker, depending on how the pacemaker is being used, but certainly if the pacemaker is needing to generate a signal that makes the heart go, and if you miss a heartbeat and the patient dies because of that, that's a pretty serious hard real time. Right? If the decision for the pacemaker to, I don't know much about how pacemakers work, but I guess they send some electrical impulse to the heart, code that has to run to figure out to send that impulse and how big it is, if that doesn't finish in time, and the patient's already dead, or the patient has a heart, heart attack because the heart stops beating, that's a pretty serious real-time problem. Any other examples of hard real-time systems? OK, good. Yeah, so industrial control systems, systems where the code is controlling some physical thing. If you're launching a rocket, and the code is running the avionics for the rocket, and it's got to decide when to shut off that engine or when to turn this, you better decide before it's too late. Those are hard real-time systems. What are examples of soft real-time systems where it's sort of OK to occasionally miss deadlines? You might not have the kind of performance you want if you miss a lot of deadlines, but it's not as bad as the patient dying or the rocket crashing. A solitary application, good, OK. So what are the deadlines there? Good, yeah. So to give a user a reasonable experience, any program that a human is sitting in front of is at least a soft real-time system. Right? If you're playing a game and you do a mouse click, you expect something to happen in response to that mouse click within what appears to the human 
basically an instant. Right? If you do a mouse click and nothing happens for a second, you get pretty disturbed. Right? So pretty much everything we do normally on computers is a soft real-time system. Things like nuclear power plants and spacecraft and pacemakers, those are things where if you miss one deadline, the whole system can fail. If you're watching a video, if you miss a deadline, well, you, you get maybe a little jitter. You don't see a frame when you were supposed to see a frame. Depending on how important the video you're watching, it's not a catastrophic event. If we are doing something that's a hard real time, so in order to have a guarantee, the only way we can really have a guarantee is if we can plan ahead. Right? If we know that this program has to finish in this amount of time, we've got to know a lot about the program. What else do we have to know? What property must a operating system provide to programs if you're going to have a hard real time system? So we're, we're writing the avionics code for our rocket or our nuclear power plant. As a programmer, we're being very careful to make sure that we know exactly how long that code's going to take. We don't have any unbounded loops. We've written code. We've analyzed it. We know that it's always going to finish in 10 milliseconds. And we need to get a result you know, within 15 milliseconds, so that's OK. What could go wrong? So if you write a program and run it on your operating system that you're running on your laptop, and you know that that code is never going to take more than 10 milliseconds to run. When you actually run it, do you know it's going to finish in 10 milliseconds? What could happen? Yeah. Right. So in, in the kinds of operating systems we're all running on our laptops, you can't make any strong claims about how long your program is going to take to finish. Even if you've really carefully analyzed your program, you understand all the memory subsystems it's using, you understand everything else that it can never take more than 10 milliseconds, you don't have any guarantee it's not going to be interrupted. If you're running on an operating system where interrupts can happen, you can't make any guarantees about your code finishing within some amount of time. So one of the things that has to happen on any system that's going to have hard real time, you're going to have to be able to turn off interrupts. You're going to be able to run this real time critical code in a way that it can't be interrupted by anything. That it's going to get to run, it's going to finish within some predetermined amount of time, and it's going to make the decision that it needs to. So that's quite different from the way our standard operating systems that we're using today are working. If we're having a planned schedule, that means we know enough to make guarantees. To make guarantees, we need to know in advance what needs to run. And we need to know that we can turn off interrupts and make sure that it's going to get to run for the amount of time that it should. Most of the scheduling we're doing is mostly on demand. Everything's unpredictable. There's very few guarantees that you can get from your Unix-based operating system. If, if you're running a process, there are very few guarantees you can get about it meeting deadlines, but you hope it meets most of them reasonably close to when you need to. So what about courses? Should they be following a planned schedule or an on-demand schedule? Some of you have noticed that we're supposed to have an exam next week. That was the planned schedule. What are the advantages of having a planned schedule in real life? Not that computer systems are really not part of real life. What are the advantages and disadvantages of planned versus on-demand schedules? Everyone still wants an exam next week? OK. Cool. Yeah. OK, good. Yeah, so there certainly are, are big advantages of planned schedule. Guarantees are worth something. If you've got a planned schedule and you've got guarantees, you can plan around those guarantees. You know exactly when things are needed. You know what you need to do to, to meet those deadlines. What are disadvantages of a planned schedule? OK, good, right. So you can adapt to things that are changing. If you need to plan your schedule in advance and set all your deadlines and set all your tasks, if a new task comes in or some task takes longer than you expected, then you're in big trouble. So you probably want some combination of this. And there's certainly a valid sense of wanting some predictability in your courses. And I don't want to disadvantage people who do plan around deadlines. My sense is a pretty small fraction of students actually plan enough that it's disruptive when deadlines like this change. So given where we are in the class, I think it makes a lot more sense not to have an exam next week and to give you a couple more days for problem set three. For those of you who do sort of on-demand scheduling of your own time, that should probably be a good thing. For those of you who do more planned scheduling, I don't want to disadvantage you because that's actually a good thing. And we do encourage students to do planned scheduling. So if you do enough of a planned scheduling that you noticed there was an exam next week, which I know a couple of you did because I didn't. And you reminded me that there was. If you do have a planned schedule and this is going to disrupt it, then you can definitely skip to the original schedule. Talk to me after class or office hours or email by tomorrow and 
we can do that. But I think for most of you, it will make more sense to do an on-demand schedule that gives you a little more time for problems at three and does not have an exam before spring break. <laughs>